This means that we can have candidates from both parties competing for judgeships who are smart, fair, honest, and capable of handling the challenges of a highly demanding court docket. At the same time, Chairman Frost and Chairman Garson have likewise committed to working with our Bar Association and our Ratings Coalition in the future vetting of individuals who are seeking judgeships, both elected and appointed, to ensure that those candidates have the appropriate credentials before they can even receive the support and endorsement from their respective parties. This is a very positive step in the right direction. I'm thrilled to be able to stand here and announce this publicly for the first time. It represents a groundbreaking advance towards the meaningful pursuit of judicial excellence in Cuyahoga County. And it wouldn't be possible without the commitment and leadership of these two party chairs working with the Bar Association. <clears throat> As you can tell, or I should say as you hopefully can tell, I'm pretty fired up about all of this. And as I turn things over to Jim Robinault and Judge McMonagall, I think you'll quickly see why I'm so confident that we are moving in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, uh, first of all, I think there's been a little bit of a mistake here. Judge McMonagall and I have been working on a Dancing with the Stars routine. We just uh, can't decide who leads. Yeah. But as long as we're here, uh, we'll talk about some things. So, Judge? Um, obviously, we've been given the somewhat daunting task of evaluating our current system of selecting judges in our county and in the state of Ohio. It's in the hopes of proposing what we hope are reasonable improvements to the current process. So far, uh, we really haven't done anything. We are just the task force. Uh, we've had an initial meeting, uh, except we have done a ton of research, which is what happens when your co-chair is a historian. <laughs> <clears throat> and is this where I plug the Warren Harding book? Yeah, that, that would be good. <laughs> All right, well, that's done. All right, seriously. <laughs> it is our intent this afternoon, hopefully, to give you the current state of affairs, the lay of the land, so to speak, so that you'll have uh, an idea of what some of the problems are that we anticipate and hopefully will ultimately address. So, Jim, what do we know for sure? Well, what we know for sure, we, we thought what we'd do is start off with um, Mike, you're going to have to come over here and press the button. Start off with what we know to be true, because um, we have to start with a baseline, and we're starting with a system that's been around for some time. If you just hit the down button. There you go. Uh, what we know to be true is this. First of all, the elective system is likely here to stay. And in fact, it's been here since 1851, when Ohio changed its constitution to provide for the election of judges. I think it will surprise some of you to know that Ohio started out appointing judges, just like the federal system. In attempts to change that system to a so-called merit selection system model in Ohio have been defeated on a statewide basis twice in the last 70 years, in 1937 and in 1987. And not just defeated. Crushed is a better word. Both times, voters rejected the idea by a two-to-one margin. So one of the things that we start with, with our task force, is this uh, knowledge that the elective system is here. Um, and the attempts to try and change in Ohio have not been successful. And so we're not going to go out and try to have a task force on merit selection. It may well be that that will arise out of what we do. But our fundamental premise is to start with the idea that we are going to assume we are electing judges. And if we're going to, then what's the situation that we're facing? You all know that the late uh, Chief Justice Tom Moyer hoped to, to have another crusade at merit selection uh, before his untimely death. He was retiring, and I think this was, has always been one of his uh, pet <coughs> projects. He was a wonderful leader of our bar, great Chief Justice, and his passing leaves that field uh, very bereft of leadership. So we'll see what happens. Point simple is we're going to assume that we're going to elect judges. 
and we're not going to debate that issue in this task force. Second thing that we know is that while voters want to hold on tightly to their right to elect judges, they know almost nothing about the people they vote for. Uh, we know that, that uh, races at the Ohio Supreme Court level are ferociously contested, but we know that most of the local level races are barely noticed. And in fact, the phenomenon that happens, and you all know about this, the phenomenon that happens at the, in the voting booth is something that social scientists call roll-off um, or drop-off, either term. And what it means is somebody voting. Now, think about this. You've got somebody in a, in a booth exercising their franchise. When they get to the judicial races, they roll off. They just simply don't vote. So, you know, we talk about electing judges. We have tremendous roll-off in this county in particular, and we'll talk, talk about why. Judge, you may have some quote to add to this. Right. Well, so that you understand, that roll-off is about 33 percent, taking the governor's race down to when the judicial races start, um, as, and probably a little bit more as you get down into the local races. Um, <clears throat> many people have studied this concept. Um, this phenomenal uh, phenomenon was also called, uh, it's called roll-off now, it was called drop-off. But uh, an Ohio State University political scientist, Lawrence, Lawrence Baum, actually carefully studied this matter in the form of exit surveys uh, hitting voters coming out of the voting booth. The surveys indicated that significant numbers uh, could not recognize the candidates, nor could they rate them. And in general, voters knew very little about the specific candidate. Moreover, and this quote, I think, kind of says everything, a substantial minority of those who recalled voting for a candidate did not offer any reasons for their choices, even with a fairly broad definition of what constitutes a reason. <laughs> All right, so you're now under truth serum. Everybody here is very active. Uh, I'm sure you all vote all the time. And I want to see a show of hands here. How many people have voted for a judicial candidate not knowing anything about that candidate? I have. Judge McMonagle has. <laughs> I mean, it's staggering. It's staggering. So again, second issue that we're dealing with is very uh, large amount of, a very large amount of, of voter ignorance. Okay, the third thing that we, that we know is true. Most races involve incumbents who win most of the time, regardless. Now, uh, what does that mean? One of the things it means in judicial elections is, as you know, or you may know, when a judge retires or resigns or there's a death in office, the governor appoints um, the successor at that point. So there's a lot of times when people uh, retire very strategically to allow other people to be appointed uh, in their party um, so that they can then run as an incumbent. This is how powerful incumbency is. In, in these races. One of the social scientists that we, that we found research on, and there is actually some good science here in, in Ohio, uh, Professor Baum at Ohio State is superb, but 80% of incumbents are reelected. 80%, I mean, it is, it is an amazing thing. So uh, what uh, the next thing that we know and we have to take as true, and that is that money plays a big role in elections. Money plays a role in elections of judges, as it does in all elections. But in this context, it is particularly problematic because judges raise money indirectly. They all have to have a committee. They can't do it directly from the very lawyers who will appear before them. So uh, this is a severe problem. This is a problem that's not just based in Ohio. And you all just saw the West Virginia case, the Supreme Court, I think it's called Caperton. Um, announced where a judge, I think, got three or five million dollars from somebody who later appeared. He refused to recuse himself. And the Supreme Court said that was a violation of, I believe, due process. But it is an issue in these, in these uh, races. If you think about it, and if you look at any judge's um, uh, uh, fundraising, most of the people who give the money to the judges are the lawyers who appear in front of them. So it's, it's a... Uh, uh, an issue that we're going to have to deal with that is, that is true. Uh, 